Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today you're in for a real treat. You're in for a good history lesson on some really, really important rifles. Most people don't realize that there's a, there's a, a lineage, a very, very close lineage between the, the HK416, the SIG 516, and the Caracal 816. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the evolution of these rifles. And there's probably going to be a lot of people that are going to be surprised what they're going to be hearing, because uh, especially when it comes to the 416. The 416, because it's H and K, they have this, this incredible reputation, and everybody says that everything they make has to be better than everything else. What we're going to find out today is that's not necessarily true. You actually have two rifles which are far less expensive, which are enhanced rifles over it. So let's jump right into it. In 2004, HK released their first external piston gun. It was actually called the HK M4. Well, Colt had a at that time had a trademark on M4, so they were forced to change it to HK416. So, oddly, it's funny enough that uh, Bushmaster took Colt to court later, and they got that nullified because the M4 was not a patentable uh, trademark because it's in general use and it was a U.S. government designation. You can't, you can't, you can't trademark a U.S. government designation. Now, where that came from was. And around 2002, 2003, uh, there were some people, some people who were very much involved with it. The first one was a design engineer. Now, this engineer this wishes to remain anonymous. You probably, you guys are probably going to know who he is, but it's his wishes that uh, we not give his name. So we're just going to say he's an HK engineer. Uh, he was over in, in Germany, and also Larry Vickers had quite a bit to do with the HK416. Now, what the HK416 really is, is a M4 with a... G36 gas system, external piston gas system. That was basically what it was. So at the time HK was, was putting this out, they were claiming this was far superior to that of the M4. Now, at the time that the M4 was having a few issues uh, with quality control, uh, and, but was quickly quickly fixed. The initial ones that went to the US military did not go very well. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of problems with them. There is a report that's out there, it's probably online, of the problems that SOCOM had had with it. Uh, so it, it took a little while to get it get it get it fixed. Uh, when they did get it fixed, it turned out to be a pretty incredible rifle. However, there are several downfalls to it. So we're gonna go over this from uh, from front to back. Now this is not an actual HK416. This is the civilian MR556A1. The big difference is the barrel. Uh, the barrel on the on the military guns is is basically a cold hammer forged chrome line barrel. For some reason, H&K, when they designed this, they put a heavy match grade barrel on it, uh, which is not as durable and it's not really that great of a combat barrel because it wears out a lot quicker. Um, basically, the industry has been, and the customers have been begging uh, HK for to give them the same barrels they have on the HK416. And again, HK is not one of those companies that tends to give customers what they want. They give them what they want to give them. Uh, there's a couple other changes that were made on here that you have to look at as well that we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Now, some of the changes that had to be made to this was because it was external piston, they had to raise the receiver up, the, the rail up, to, to, let, to let the, allow the external piston system to work. So this is a proprietary handguard. Now, this is gonna play a key role in all of this, proprietary. Most of the parts on this rifle are proprietary to H and K, there is no other source for them. And that causes a problem for a military customer. If they need parts immediately, First off, HK has got to be able to produce them and get them to you in a reasonable time. And second is the cost. Any part on here, a bolt for instance, is probably three to four times the cost of a standard mil spec bolt. And the receiver extensions, a lot of these, these parts on here are not compatible with anything else that's out there. So we're going to be getting to that when we start to get into the other two rifles. So we have a proprietary handguard. Now, what I have on here are the HK military sights. These came with, uh, originally they came with diopter sights like the MP5, and then they stopped doing that and they started coming with Magpul sights. What these are, are the actual HK military sights. The gas block has a notch on here. Now, the new rifles that have the longer handguard, you can't use this because this is all covered up. Um, this is the original military handguard where you could, so you push, the, you pull up and lift up on that sight, then you flip up this one. These are your backup sights. Now, this is set, even though this sits lower, it's aligned perfectly with the sight here for you to be able to have accuracy with it. So that's a feature that I put on here myself. And I have to say, these are very difficult parts to get. Very, very difficult. If you also look at the top here, you're gonna see how this index is in place. You have a notch on the receiver. Now the charging handle on here is reversible. It is ambidextrous, but it's reversible. You have to mechanically reverse it. On, on this version here. 
Now, the new HK416, uh, the newest A5 models, have the AMB Extras features on them. This is one of their original rifles that came in, and these do not have AMB features on them. So that's something that's going to be different with the newer HK models. So looking here, we have uh, the MR556 bolt. You can see MR for, uh, this lets you know that it's a commercial one. And we're going to get into it when we take the rifle apart. You're going to be able to see uh, precisely what that means. You have a polymer ejection port, which is another interesting thing because the original HKM4, it did not have an ejection port cover. They said that it wasn't needed. It was more of a customer thing. They thought HK was just being cheap. So HK went ahead and they put a polymer uh, ejection port cover on it. Now, for these to come into the country, they couldn't be imported uh, as complete rifles. So you had to have a certain amount of American parts that were made here in the United States. The lower receiver came in as a forging, but they are manufactured here in the United States in their Georgia facility. And you can see HK uh, in Corp, Columbia, Columbus, Georgia, which is right outside of Fort Benning. Now, the trigger is very, very interesting in the safety on here. Now, normally, if you were to pull the trigger and fire, you're not able to engage the safety until you, you, you rack it back. Now, European standards are very different. They had to make it so whether the hammer was forward or backwards, you would still be able to engage the safety. LMT just did this with their axle trigger for another, one, of their one of their contracts, but this was something that was gave that came out by H&K. HK had their own proprietary pistol grip, which is not necessarily the most comfortable thing, but depends. I'm more of a Magpul Maya guy myself. You have a little bit more of a flare on your magazine well than you had on the M4s. And you flip over to the side, you'll see this is this is basic M4, your basic ping pong paddle, basic safety. This is a this is pretty pretty standard. Again, the stock you have here, this is a monstrosity. Uh, again, these parts are all, uh, they're all, they're all proprietary to H&K. And we're going to get into a little bit more of this when we take it apart. Now, the disassembly is where this gets a little bit interesting because uh, this is something that really upset the, the, uh, the customers was when you look at the front and rear takedown pin, you can't just push them out. You actually have a detent that's in here. The HK claims that it does that, you know, to keep the, you know, the guns more, uh, the receivers tighter together. A lot of people don't buy that, but uh, that's what it was. So... To, to, to disengage the, the pivot pins and the receiver and rear takedown pin, you have to push in on both. Now your upper and lower will separate. Now you notice here you have basically a full auto hammer on here, but your disconnectors are all uh, semi-automatic only. There's a change that they put on here that was a really good idea. Now this can only be done with uh, mostly with semi-automatics uh, with regular rifles but they got this to work with both uh, full auto and semi. You'll see there's a piece of metal right here. What that piece of metal does is when the hammer comes back, it prevents the, ham the hammer from hitting the disconnector. Now that's one of the things that the M16 M4 has always had is with heavy use, the tail of that hammer would strike the, the tail of the, uh, the, the disconnector and eventually they could wear it off and it can break it. You'll see that it does do peening. So basically they stopped it by putting this, this guard in here. So this also will prevent some of the trigger slap as well. Now the buffer is very interesting as well. The way they got this gun to work reliably was to heavily, heavily overgas it. You have an extremely heavy recoil spring and the buffer you you have here, notice you don't hear any, any noise in there. This is full of a tungsten powder, uh, which is much more dense than the sliding weights, and it works a hell of a lot better. Uh, however, it's more expensive, but this is one thing that they had to do to make this gun reliable. And we're gonna get into some of those things that are not so good about this gun coming up now. Another thing is here, the stock comes off and you have a compartment in there. Instead of having just one drain hole, you have three additional large drain holes. If the rifle was to be submerged in water, basically in a regular rifle, you could have hydro lock in here because it's, it's going to trap the, the, the water in the, in the buffer. And this is going to work like a piston uh, when, it, when it comes back. So what this does is the water that's in here, it ejects that water out the back of the stock. So that's one of the things. There's something else that goes into over the beach capabilities also, which we're going to be getting into. Also for this rifle, you'll see that we have a... Allen key here, that's this assembly tool for the uh, rear takedown pins if you don't have anything available to you. Now, another really neat thing that they did here, instead of having a round 
firing pin, rotating pin, they have a square. So this is a much more durable than the standard M4, the way that it engages. So for reassembly, drop that right back on. But yeah, this uh, when you pull the bolt back on this, you will see a significant difference between this and these other guns that we're going to be talking about. And then we just rotate that on an angle. And that's lower. This magazine we have here, there's three different generations of magazines. One is the steel magazine that was used uh, for the S80, the, uh, the British L85 rifles. And basically this, this magazine well comes down a lot more, a lot further than the standard uh, Stenag M16 M4 would. So that made there some, being some compatibility issues with non-Stenag magazines. For instance, the Magpul Gen 1s and 2s wouldn't fit in it. So Magpul went and made the E-Mag. When they came out with the Gen 3 P-Mag, they fixed that so it could be used in all of them. But this is the, they had, originally they had the steel, then they had a, a translucent. The translucent was not so good. Um, I had actually broken a couple of those because I used them in my regular lineup. And this is the current generation, which is basically a polymer magazine. It has uh, you know, some windows down here. And again, these magazines, you might as well give up your firstborn for them because they are really, really expensive. Now we're going to get into the bolt carrier group. Again, we have a close-up here of the charging handle. Again, that, this latch can be replaced and reversed onto the other side. Now, I'm, the current ones, as I understand, have uh, two latches on here, but this one only has the one. You just would reverse it. Now we get really interesting. This has a little gadget on here that is very uncommon. You don't ever see in rifles. Uh, in fact, uh, the only other one that's ever seen this is the SIG MCX. And the SIG MCX had to do it because of the fact they had a, some 300 blackout cartridges with light primers. And they just had a slam fire, so they went ahead and they changed them all. This rifle is extremely overgassed. When it's extremely overgassed, you have a very, very high cyclic rate. Now, when you have a very, very high cyclic rate, you have slamming the, the firing pins going back and forth. So they had experienced slam fires with this gun because of the higher cyclic rate. Basically, what we have here is a firing pin safety. When the hammer comes up, it disengage, it pushes upward and disengages. Once in this position here, it's locked, the firing pin cannot move forward. The only way that it can move forward is when the hammer comes forward, it pushes upward on it, and that releases the, the firing pin so it can move. So this is to prevent slam fires. So that sort of tells me that there's an issue. Now, we have also MR. What that means is this little notch right here. This little notch here basically goes along with the MR, which is the civilian version. This mates up with a notch that is on the barrel extension. Now, uh, if you were to try to put a standard full auto carrier in there, it would not that, that this tab would prevent it from being able to be used. So this rifle was made so you could not use a standard bolt carrier. You would have to use only this one. Again, proprietary components. So for disassembly, we have another really awesome feature on here. This is something that I've been telling many manufacturers about for years. A captive firing pin retaining pin. Awesome idea. So now we have to lift upward on the firing pin safety. And now we can draw out the firing pin. As you can see, the firing pin has a spring. This is a completely proprietary firing pin uh, and spring. Lift out the cam pin, which is proprietary as well, and we pull the bolt out. And as you can see, this bolt is completely proprietary. Um, and you, see, you can't use any standard M4 bolt. Uh, you do have it's a little bit stronger, definitely, than probably your average bolt. And we can push out on the extractor pin. We can pull that right out. And basically, we only have a, a, a buffer in, in the middle. We don't have a, a, a O-ring on here. But again, very, very well made, but this is all proprietary. So we'll get that back together. So now we insert the bolt into the carrier. We just line up the hole again, because uh, we don't have a carrier key. We just drop that in and make sure we have the, the hole pointed us forward. Now, so when it gets a little bit more tricky, when we drop the firing pin in place, we have to disengage the firing pin safety to drop that into place. Now, we push in the firing pin retaining pin. There you have the bolt carrier. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the gas system. 
Now, this is sort of interesting, but there's a few different ways this is done. Some of them use Allen keys. Uh, some of them you would actually use your bolt locking lug. Now, this was not really that great of an idea, but this is what they did. You can use your locking lug to uh, unscrew this, but not really that great of an idea. I just like, prefer to use a screwdriver. We got that unscrewed. We're going to pull out the screw and we're just going to push this handguard forward. And now we expose the gas system. Now, the gas system that you see on here is identical to that of the G36. The only thing that's different is the operating rod. In fact, the piston that you're going to see in here, this is the exact same piston that's interchangeable with the G36. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to pull back on the operating rod. We're going to make sure the piston stays forward. We're going to lift that right out. The operating rod and return spring are all one piece. Now we pull out the piston. So interesting thing about this piston is it ejects the gas out a hole in the front. Well, the only problem with ejecting a hole on the front is that you get a heat signature or thermal signature that you can see on night vision or thermal. Uh, so that's not necessarily a good thing. You want to get rid of as much flash as possible, which is going to be addressed to come. So again, you see there's also gas rings on here. The reason why you use gas rings on one of these is because by sealing that chamber up further, what that does is it requires you to use less gas. Well, in the case of this one, it doesn't really matter because this thing is over gas to begin with. But in most cases, when you see these piston rings, that that's to uh, make it so you don't have to use as much gas because you don't have any gas flowing back. And as you can see, you have uh, a, you know you have a pinned in with spring pins, your front sight base so it doesn't move. You have a proprietary barrel nut. So for reassembly, you're gonna drop that back into place. You're gonna make sure that you have the flat end up. Put that in. And there you go. So as you can see how it works, it just basically pushes back. You got about a little over an inch or so of travel that's in there. And one of the things that this also does that some people don't particularly care for, the spring basically stops itself. So what that can do is that can cause this, your spring to actually break with, uh, with heavy use. So for reassembly, you make sure that you take the edge that has the notch on it, because that's going to mate up with this notch right here. Now we're going to put the screw back in place. Let's go ahead and hand tighten that up. Now like a regular AR-15 M16, we're just going to drop a charging handle in place. Insert your bolt carrier group. Now we have this little pain we have to deal with again with these uh, these pens. So now what we have to do is take our our pin punch. We have to depress the detent. to go through. Do it with the front. Same thing with the rear. Again, that's not that's not done on, on the military version. It's only this thing. Now, this rifle caused a big stir around the 2000, oh, I would say the 2004, 2005 time period when it came out. Uh, basically, what HK was telling the, the U.S. soldiers was there's a better rifle and you can't have it. So basically, what HK had done was they were making soldiers uh, lose faith in their weapon when the weapons weren't even failing. They basically knew that there's only way they could get into the U.S. government was if they said the M4 was bad because there's a, there a sole source on it. And they had to replace it because it was deficient. So it caused a lot of problems, and they also made a lot of false claims. Uh, this rifle, one thing that it will do that the M4 will not 
is you can come up out of water and you can fire it. And that problem is with the with the internal piston is, is the gas tube gets full of water and that causes problems. The external piston is not a problem. That's the one benefit that it does have. And the benefit also is in short barrels. Short barrels, this is the an external piston system tends to work a lot better. But this caused a lot of problems uh, and it was part of the reason why we had the individual carbine program. Um, this has seen service in SOCOM, not as much as you would think. Uh, it has seen service with some with Delta units and with some SEAL units. Oddly enough, the most popular weapon to this day with SOCOM is still the M4A1 with the SOCOM barrel. And it's been far more successful than this one has for as far as the numbers are concerned. Now, this has been adopted by several militaries. Recently, it was with the French Army, <coughs> excuse me, adopted it. Uh, is there a standard, standard battle rifle? There's been several countries that have adopted it. It does see service. Its biggest problem is the same problem that all HKs have, is that it's very, very expensive. So this is the HK416. Again, we're looking at the R556. Now we're going to look at the SIG 516. After the HK416 was done, the HK engineer relocated to the United States and went to work for SIG. And when he went to work for SIG, he went to work with their senior engineer, Chris Sorois. And him and Chris got together, and they were charged with building a better rifle than the 416. They wanted a rifle that was going to correct all of the problems. And the 516 is that rifle. Now, the major differences were the proprietary components. The HK 416 used all proprietary parts. When you look at what was done with the, uh, the SIG 516, you went with standard fire control groups, standard M4 bolt, standard M4 type barrel. They do have a different profile on it, but you could use a standard M4 barrel on there. They also made some improvements to the magazine well. They also made an, an improvement by having an uh, ambidextrous magazine release. You have a much, uh, much higher profile safety. They also added QD points on here. So we have the oversized trigger guard for, for having loved hands, which is, a, which is a benefit to it as well. There's another feature that we're gonna show you a picture of. This first appeared in the HK416 and I believe the G36. Basically what it was is it was a extractor guard. It's a pin that you're gonna see when the bolt rotates into the lock position. This is for over the beach con conditions. What it does is it sits over the extractor. So if there was to be a overpressure, the extractor would not be able to blow out and it would hold the extractor together. And there was only one place for that, that bullet to go is down the range. So one place for that pressure to go. So that was started off with the 416 and it was carried over to the SIG. So we have a standard receiver extension. The major thing that they did was they slowed this sucker down. They got this to the same slot rate as our standard M4, the uh, 759 or 50 rounds a minute. Generally, they tried to get around 825 was, was basically their, their, their goal with it, with the standard ball the standard ball ammunition that they were testing with. That was probably the most, one of the most important parts that they did. They also made several modifications to the gas system which went along with uh, was slowing down that cyclic rate. That was a major improvement over the HK416, that and the, and the components. We're taking a look at this from muzzle to rear, starting off with the flash compressor. This is actually an A2 compensator, the barrel, 4150 chrome molly vanadium, and this is also nitride. This is something else that was interesting. Uh, Chris Royce and this other engineer, they actually felt that the nitriding was superior to the cold hammer forged chrome plated. So they just, so that's why SIG actually produces all of these. Now SIG does offer both. If they had a military customer that said we want a cold hammer forged barrel, they would go ahead and do that. They, they would they would they would give it to them. But the the preferred barrel was this nitride. Also the HK416, the military versions did have a suppressed and unsuppressed. You have uh, three positions on here as well. Now the nice thing about this gas system was you'll see when we take it apart. We don't have to take off the handguard to be able to get to the gas system on the on the SIG 516. So it eliminated a whole issue with uh, with maintenance in the field with having to remove that handguard to get to your your, uh, your your gas system. And regardless of what anybody says, you have to maintain a gas system, which happens with with the external piston guns. You'll get carbon freeze, and that piston can be frozen in place. Everyone needs to be maintained. That's a big fallacy that you don't have to. So what he did here was you have two you have two positions. Which is uh, which is suppressed and unsuppressed. Now, if you push the button, you can rotate it to one other position, which is adverse, which is not something you normally have to use. Now, this rifle has the 1913 rail on it, and as you can see, we have the Magpul 1913 rail covers. Now, these uh, these sights these sights were originally uh, made by Sig. That's something that also changed to Sig now calls them optics ready. They don't provide these guns with uh, backup sights any longer, which is sort of a shame.
You have a standard M4 upper receiver. You have a lower receiver has had some, some changes to it. They improved the uh, sculpture as well. Again, you can see the fire, you can see the safety. Again, you have a longer safety on the left side. You have a longer safety on the left side, and you have a shorter one on the right set up for a right-handed person. The stock we have in here is a BCM uh, type of SOP mod stock. A standard receiver extension. We have a staked in uh, receiver extension nut and a receiver extension end plate. Now the optic I have on here is a SIG 124. This was an ideal one for a 556, uh, and that's why I have it on here. Uh, well, these are actually SIG mounts as well, because as you know, SIG has its own optics, weapons, and ammunition manufacturing. So this is all basically SIG as a system. They basically made it so you could have a one-shop stop for all your needs, ammo, gun, and optic. And now also SIG has suppressors. So we're gonna take this apart and we're gonna take a look more a little bit more closely. This one has regular front and rear takedown pins. You don't have to use any kind of a tool. Now this normally comes with a standard mill spec type trigger. I actually put another Geisley in this one. Because uh, again, I, I tend to prefer those over uh, standard mill spec ones. Now, we look over here, we can see some other some smart things that were done. We have an extension on the bolt catch, which makes it much easier to manipulate. So it's much easier to, to reach and not hit the magazine release. So again, we have that. We have the ambidextrous magazine release. Now, the buffer. This is something that's different with a selective fire. Now, the buffer in this one, you can hear the steel weights. This is the H buffer. Uh, they don't require an H2 because this isn't a heavy barrel, but you can hear that. The military ones are made the exact same way that they were done in Germany. They use uh, they use powder, powder tungsten, and that you can't hear. Uh, that it works much better on stopping the, uh, the bolt carrier mounts. Now we're going to take a look at the bolt and the charging handle. Okay, looking at the charging handle, we actually have a fully ambidextrous charging handle versus what they had on the HK416. So that was good for left and right handed. Now we're going to see some other major changes was the bolt carrier. Now, the only part that's proprietary on here is just the bolt carrier. The bolt, cam pin, firing pin, firing pin, retaining pin, those are all standard uh, M4 type components. The whole point of this was if you can't get parts from, from you know, the, the main OEM, they could go to, you know, for this one, you could go to Colt and say, I want to get uh, a bolt, firing pin, and uh, firing pin, retaining pin, and cam pin. You could drop those Colt parts right in here. Not this. This is only H&K parts. So taking a look at the carrier, we can see that it's been lightened up a little bit. And you can also see how the ass end of this is bulged. It's, it's a larger diameter. This is to stop carrier tilt. Uh, so basically when it sits in there, you have a, a ramp in here, and it keeps everything lined up properly so you don't have that issue. So for disassembly, it's the same as a standard M4. Pull out your firing pin retaining pin. A standard M4 firing pin, as we said. Standard cam pin. And standard bolt. They even have the gas rings on here. Now the reason you have gas rings on here, there's no functional reason other than assembly. It makes it easier to assemble because the bolt's not falling in and out. So that's really why you see it. But again, if something went wrong and you needed parts, again, Standard, Colt, LMT, anybody who's making regular M4 parts that can be used. That's the only part that's proprietary, and this is nothing's going to go wrong with. These don't break. So reassembly is the same. Make sure your extractor's at 3 o'clock position. You're going to drop this in so you have the holes going forward. Now we take the firing, firing pin, we drop in. You also see that we don't have any need for a firing pin safety. And we don't even have a need for a firing pin spring because the socket rate is down where it needs to be and not overgassed. And it, this is not going to beat itself up nearly as fast as this one. Now we're going to take a look at the gas system. Again, if you, noticing here, you see a button that's pushed. Basically, we're going to push that button in. We're going to rotate and we're going to pull right out. And the entire gas system pulls right out. They've eliminated the need for an extra part for the piston. Basically, your piston is on the end of your operating rod, and your gas valve and your, your, your expansion chamber are all together. Now we can see that we have three different gas positions. We have standard, suppressed, and adverse. Each one of them will get, will get larger. The way that Chris and this other gentleman designed this was you could not put it on overgassed accidentally. 
you literally had to push the button to do it that would prevent this gun from being overgassed and you have to basically make sure that you knew you wanted to do that really there's not much need for it you really would have to be in a really serious condition to be able to do it now possibly on that full open it might work with wolf reliably i don't know uh, the shorter barrels nothing works with wolf um the 16 inch barrel probably will work but some of your ammunition is lower this got the lower pressures that would open it up to allow it to be used again we have a re return spring we have a guide on there as well all stainless steel and this one also uses gas rings so this one uses the gas rings for the right reason part of slowing it down is being able to use less gas so what this does it seals off that chamber so the gun can require a lot less gas than the, you know the normally like the 416. These rings don't really do much with a 416 for as far as lowering stock to right, but that's basically why you would want to use uh, gas rings. For instance, the Colt uh, APC or Advanced Piston Carbine uses them, LMT uses them on their external piston gun. Most of the modern manufacturers do use these things with the short stroke systems. Reassembly, very easy. So now we're going to use, we're going to reinsert the uh, operating rod right to the top, and go all the way back. Now we're going to take your gas valve. Insert it. again. We'll make sure that the, these are going to be going down. You also have some additional weep holes on here as well. Push it inward, and we're going to push this button to get that in place. So, again, top is normal. Switch to the second one for uh, suppressed. Now you got to push the button in to move it over to uh, adverse. So this rifle was a major improvement over the uh, HK M4 or HK416. Most people won't believe that because, again, they believe that HK has to make a better gun than SIG. The way this rifle was designed, it corrected a lot of the deficiencies that the HK416 had. And this one here, I know if we're talking to Chris Royce, he had done absolutely incredible demonstrations of this all over the world. Um, by having the over-the-beach capabilities, by having the... the, the uh, the, the extractor guard this thing here was taking out of water they've in fact i do recall him saying that they did uh over i think it was ten thousand rounds that they did or was it twenty thousand rounds it was ten or twenty thousand rounds that they did for one of their demonstrations where basically they'd fire the fire it they would dip the gun in a uh, bucket of a big a big 55 gallon drum of water to cool it down pulled it right back out did another i think he said i think it was a thousand rounds that he fired did that, and then he uh, would do it again. He went through that whole thing, and he basically blew these people away with uh, the durability of this gun. This gun has seen a lot of service throughout the world. It's uh, beat HK in, in several competitions as well. Because what really made the difference was the initial guy who worked for H&K came here with his experience from the HK, 416 and HK M4. Chris Royce had his, his background as well. And they did exactly what they were they were challenged to do. Now comes to what I consider the best kept secret in the industry. This gun is manufactured by a company called Caracal. Caracal is a UA, UAE based company uh, owned by a company called Tawazun. And it was a very interesting story, which we're going to get into right now. UAE in the Middle East. Middle East is not what you call a manufacturing hub of the world. They don't have. It's not like a gun manufacturer here in the U.S. where you have. You have job shops. You know, you work for Colt. You have somebody who does your, your polymer. You have somebody who does your heat treating. Somebody does your your pens. Somebody does your fire control groups. You have a whole system of companies that assist you with that. Well, UAE doesn't have that. So they hired the gentleman from from HK and, and SIG and SIG, Chris Royce, to go over to the UAE. Not only were they to develop a new gun, but they were to develop a entire manufacturing facility because in the uae they did not have the uh, capabilities to uh have job shops they had to bring everything every part of that rifle into one complex so the same complex did everything from receivers anodizing uh making barrels um right down to the pistol grips every part was made in the uae and why was that done well one of the problems that we had that they have overseas is the U.S. State Department. Uh, the U.S. State Department, you have to have an approval from them to be able to sell firearms and apply you buy for a license. Now, the problem is one day you can send them a license and they approve. The next day, if that country does something to piss them off, they deny. 
So you were rely there, you the all the people in the Middle East were relying on Western manufacturers, and you're at the whim of whether they want to sell you or not. It's a very bad place to be in. Uh, and they also did not want to have anything to do with American parts either, because again, if you can't get a parts, you, your production would be down. So it was built there with a the manufacturing facility. They did it, and you know, I, I was over there a while ago, and it was it's an incredible facility. You eat off the floors. Now, they brought talent in from all over the world. Uh, there was people from Germany, people from England, people from India. Uh, they had they had engineers from all over the world that came to this place to to set it up and to, and to run it. So they were tasked by the Sheik to build a gun better than the 416 and the SIG 516. So this is the third evolution of this of this family of weapons. So basically what we have here is a rifle that's it's very similar to the SIG, but there were some changes that were made. So first of all, we're going to start off at the front. I have an ASR mount. This, these normally come with regular A2 flash suppressors or compensators. The barrel that you have here, very like, much like the SIG, they did with, went with nitriding over at Caracal as well in the UAE because, again, both engineers felt that this was a better way to go than the, than the cold hammer forged, uh, chrome plated. So the barrels are cold hammer forged, but they are not chrome plated over there. The UAE guns are a little bit different than the ones that are over here, um, and this handguard is where we're going to start with that. The guns that were made in the UAE, as you'll see a, fit, a picture of, has a Milstander 1913 quad rail. Now, uh, when you, when Caracal USA was opened up to bring production over here, the engineers wanted to look at the American market. Uh, guess what they were going to be selling? And, of course, m -lock was the thing that was there. So they changed to a m -lock rail instead of a 1913. Now, looking at the gas system, the gas system is very much like that of the, uh, eight, the uh, SIG 516. No proprietary components other than the bolt carrier in this one as well. So what changes that were made? First off, you'll see that the lower receiver has got some modifications. There's a whole new type of uh, other type of a sculpture, a massively flared uh, magazine well, and you had grooves in the front where you're able to, to grip the rifle very well. On the left side, you'll see it's a standard mill spec. This is not a uh, ambidextrous rifle, so you have a standard ping pong paddle, standard safety. Now, receiver extension, standard mill spec, um, and these come with the uh, STR bag pull stocks on them. Now, the, uh, these were, I believe these are PRI uh, sites that I put on it, and I have the uh, VCOG on here, which is another optic I'm very, very fond of. So we're going to take this apart, and we're going to take a look at some of the things in the inside. And then we'll take a look at the gas system as well. Now again, this comes with a mil spec trigger. I put I put a uh, a actually I was a finely tuned uh, Geisley uh, SSA in here. We're going to get into the good parts here. If you look in here with this button in here, this is a tension to keep the receivers from being loose. Now Sig was using a they, they went back and forth. They were using this for a while, and then they finally switched over to they went to an accu wedge that was a rubber piece that sits right in the back here. Does the same thing, just uh, obviously a lot less expensive. Now the buffer. This is another major change that was done to the rifle. Now one of the major changes that they did was the was the buffer itself. Now, as we as we mentioned, HK used tungsten, tungsten powder, and Sig uses on their commercial rifles they use sliding weights, but on their military rifles they use tungsten powder. Caracal uses only tungsten powder, and this was specially designed. This was, man, was made so they could fit more tungsten powder in it, make the buffer heavier. And that worked as a very big enhancement. Again, gun is not overgassed. It's got a more efficient cycling system, and it uses a much more expensive and a much more efficient buffer system. Then we're going to take a look at the upper receiver. First, we'll take a look at the bolt carrier group. Now the charging handle is very much also a modified part from the uh, from the SIG. This has got more of the gas buster features to it where you have this hanging down on the side to bring gas from coming back at your face. And you also have a basically a channel that drives the gas to come out to the side and not back into the shooter's face. Major enhancement. Like the, the, the SIG, you have a proprietary carrier, but all the other components are mil spec. Disassembly, it's the same. You have a standard type 
get a rotating spring, a standard firing pin, standard cam pin, standard bolt. And again, this is a standard M4 bolt. Uh, the way these are manufactured, they're, uh, they have the gas rings on them already. And again, what does the gas rings do? It just uh, makes it easier for assembly. Now this is also a QPQ and I tried finished as well. Now you see that we call the tombstone up here. The assembly is much easier with having those rings on there. Now we're gonna take a look at the gas system. Again, just like the, the SIG, you don't have to take the hangar off of this. This, again, they did the same thing with using the button, you know, suppressed, unsuppressed, and then, you would, then you'll have your uh, disassembly. Slightly modified, a little bit different from the SIG. And you pull, you also have the gas rings as you do on the SIG. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the gas valve here, you can see the three different holes going small, medium, and large. So again, to, to go with a large, you really have to be in a really nasty condition uh, for that to make a difference. Now again, you'll see the picture again of the barrel extension. It has the extractor uh, protector on there. So again, if this was to go, this was to go boom and have a, say you have a bullet that was caught in the barrel and then you were to fire a second round, this gun's not gonna blow up. The bolts are gonna go out the barrel and the gun will still work. It's a very, it's a very indestructible uh, rifle the way that they had made it. So for reassembly, this one here you have to index as well. And there you have it. Now, some other special things about the Caracal. This gun was designed with a specific region in mind. It was designed for the desert. So when everything was designed, it was designed so it would work in the desert because it was designed for use for the UAE and the Arab countries. When I was in UAE, you'll see some photographs of this. The gentleman uh, from h &K, he did an incredible demonstration for me. Uh, we took the rifle right out back of uh, where Caracal was in the UAE and in, in Abu Dhabi. My God, it was it was hot as hell there. It was uh, and the wind was like being in a. In, anyways, it was really really hot. He takes the rifle and he throws it in the sand. He covers the rifle up with, with the sand. Go, we go in, we shoot it. Not a single problem. With ejection port cover open. This gentleman got on, got on in a crawl, low crawl position and was crawling in the sand, kicking sand up all over it. Went back into the range. He shot a magazine and then he gave me probably four or five magazines. I shot it. There were several other people that were in there at that, at that time as well. I was shocked. What I had saw there, I had seen many rifles uh, in my career fail. This was, this was really incredible how that it worked. So the way the tolerances are in here, the way everything is done, it was designed specifically to work in that region. So uh, Caracal has gone, has gone on to have a lot of international sales, including the Indian military. Uh, they have a lot of major contracts. Now, when Chris Sorois uh, and Jeff Spaulding started up, Caracal USA went to Wilcox at first, and then went to uh, Caracal, in, I think it's in, uh, Caracal in Idaho. It was a manufacturing facility there. So the, the American-made guns were also be, they were made for export as well. The commercial rifles, there's not really any distributors who sell them. If you want to get a rifle from Caracal, you have to call Caracal directly, uh, and they'll work with your with your FFL to, to, to get you one. But you don't see a lot of advertising. You don't see a lot of content creators. In fact, the only content creators that have done this is me and Mike over at Mr. Mr. Guns and Gear. We're the only ones who've done anything on this. Because, again, people don't know about it, especially knowing that this is part of a trilogy, and it is the most it's the improved of all of them. All three of these rifles, this is the top dog. It's just a final iteration. And the same gentleman who did the who did the HK worked on this and the SIG. Chris Royce worked on this and that and the, the Caracal. And if you look back at SIG as well, 
Chris and uh, this gentleman from h &K, they were also responsible for the SIG 516, uh, the 716. They were responsible for the MCX, MPX. Um, so they were the most important designs there. In fact, if you look at the MCX, they had the prototypes for the th for the 308 versions of the SIGs, the, the MCX back around 2008, and it just sat there from 2008 until the M7 program came up. They pulled that out of the out of the vault. They modified it with the new caliber, the 68 by 51, and there you have it. So this group of gentlemen are probably responsible for some of the most advanced weapons in the industry today. Uh, these two gentlemen are probably the stoners of the last 20 years. Um, they've made, they designed the next military rifle, which, again, I don't believe it's going to be general issue. I believe it's going to be specialized. But these gentlemen did it. So this is a, basically some information that you have here that you didn't, you didn't hear before. We're going to go to the range and we're going to fire all three of these. And you can uh, just see how they shoot.
as you see, all three of them work. Absolutely no problem. I fired the Caracal on multiple times with, with in the suppress setting with a suppressor. All these guns are top rate. But again, looking from the beginning to the end, you had a starting point, which was overgassed. Uh, that had, was to the point where you had to have a firing pin safety on it. All proprietary components. Now we go to the SIG 516. We're using mostly all regular components. We're using a lighter rifle. We have all the same features for over the beach capabilities. Uh, we have an improved magazine well. We had a lot of improvements on there. And then we go over to the Caracal 816, which is improvements over this with the gas system, with the buffer, um, with with the, these few other things that we discussed as well. So if you guys are interested in getting a Caracal, all you have to do is contact those guys directly and uh, you know call them at their, their factory and say you want one. They will set you up with your FFL. You're not probably going to walk into a gun shop and find one. Um, they don't do a lot of that marketing. They're, more, they're really more interested in doing military sales. They have all the civilian stuff if you want it. It's, it's available. So if you want it, you can go ahead and get it. So I hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, even better share.